um, introduce Sean Hannon, who is the IT director for the town. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Sean. How you doing? Thanks for joining us, Sean. Yeah. It's much go a little smoother, I think. Yes. Um, so we're just missing Jesse. Oh, Jesse. Hi. Hi. Hello, everybody. So as I said, we're recording now. Thanks, Stephanie. Hi, everybody. Um, oh, is Sarah, is Sarah joining today? Sarah Short? I haven't heard from her. Okay. Okay, so we'll definitely take some time to talk and debrief about what happened at our last meeting, the other meetings over the weekend. Um, but let's just go ahead and uh, do the sort of procedural stuff we need to do, which is starting first with reviewing the minutes from last week and last time, excuse me, voting on those and then assigning a new meeting taker, which I believe this week will be Sarah Durr based on alphabetical order. That's okay with you, Sarah. Great. And thank you to Darcy for taking the minutes from the June 18th meeting. Sure. Do you have the minutes up or the agenda still? I have nothing up. Uh, the oh. agenda. Agenda. Okay. Did you want me to share the minutes or is everybody looking at them on their own screen? I'm just putting them up now. Okay. I can never tell if you have them or not, so just let me know. <laughs> yes, got the minutes. Okay, thank you. It's, it's <laughs> frustrating because I can't tell. Anyone have comments or is anyone willing to motion to accept these minutes? I motion to accept. Second. Okay, you need a roll call vote. Okay. Uh, may not be in order. Sorry, I'm just going to go by my um, by my screen here. So Dumont, yes. Drucker, yes. Gregor, yes. Roof, yes. Uh, but I should note that technically my appointment on the committee has expired as of yesterday. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Expect I'm expecting to be reappointed based on what I've heard from staff the paperwork yet so um minutes look fine to me if i'm not allowed to vote that's okay we're gonna assume you can given we know that you're being reappointed so okay we'll just roll with it for now all right rose. a provisional ballot yes <laughs> there you go yes rose yes uh Durr. sarah do we have you sarah Durr? 
Great. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Sorry, I was tightening. That's okay. Um, Ravi Kumar. Yes. Okay. All right. Did you get Jesse or Jesse? Uh, I think I did. I get you, Jesse. I'm sorry if I didn't. Did I? I don't. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you moved, didn't you? Okay. So we're good. Okay, so there's no public, I believe. Art email. Actually, up. no. I'm sorry. We do have one. Uh, oh, okay. Public person, um, Andrew Glace. I'm going to allow him. I do know him. I do know Andrew. Andrew, I'm allowing you to um, to speak. He's he's still muted. How's that? Can you? Oops. Oh, I had him unmuted and now I've muted him. <sighs> Hold on. Can you? Sorry, Andrew. On the camera too. Um, I could actually. I do know Andrew, so I will happily do that. Andrew, I've promoted you to a panelist, so you can actually speak. You may have to unmute yourself. I can't. Un so, Andrew, you have the um, control of uh, muting or unmuting yourself. There you go. How's you can, that? That's great. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrew Blaze, um, longtime resident of Amherst. I'm the president of GNL Energy Services. We work with businesses and institutions to cut their energy bills. And I'm very pleased to be sitting in on this committee, mostly listening. Thank you, Stephanie. You're welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Welcome. Okay, Stephanie, staff updates. Um, so Art Keen um, sent an email that he wasn't going to be able to attend our meeting tonight, but that he was willing to publish an update and summary um, of what we're up to. If anyone's interested in providing him with something, he'd be happy to publish it. And he said, if there's anything that we think he should cover, we can let him, we can let him know. Um, and that was all. And then I just wanted to also let you all know that um, again, that Sean Hannon is here, the IT director, and um, post what happened Sunday um, with our meeting, with our Zoom meeting. Um, I've been in contact with Sean, and Sean, not to put you on the spot, but I don't know if there's anything you want to say about steps we're taking to try to um, ensure that as much as possible we can prevent that from happening again. Yeah. I, I, I don't have a whole lot to add. We're, um, we're strongly encouraging people to join through the link just so we don't get, end up with essentially people joining as imposters. Um, and we're also just reviewing. Um, we're looking into what other options there are out there. If people, um, members of the public who want to participate and show their video, if there's a, um, a better way to do it than bringing them in as, in this panelists. Um, it's frankly just a, a little cumbersome, um, it's a little cumbersome to do and it, it opens us up to uh, problems like what we experienced this weekend. John, has there been any guidance from the state about how to handle this? No, Not there has body, body in, in particular, but it just feels like we're being both hindered by open meeting law and also hurt by it <laughs> in the situation that has happened to us twice now. Um, and I know it's happened once with the town council and it just seems like there needs to be, I mean, this seems like the foreseeable future are these remote meetings. Um, and I'm just wondering if you're getting any support from the state. 
No, we and and I've reached out to. There's a listserv of IT directors, basically in Western Mass, um, and what we've found is that the Amherst is kind of on the the forefront of a lot of this. A lot of other communities are not allowing any live public comment at all. Um, none of them are allowing. Um, none of them are allowing public comment remotely with video. Um, Talk to Agawam, Westfield, um, Westside, and they're all they're all kind of um, they're either allowing call-in voice-only public input, or they're not allowing it. Basically, their public input is you send an email or a, um, you know or a letter um, to board or committee members ahead of time. So um, we're kind of. On, on the forefront of it here. So we're still, I think we're still trying to figure out what we can do to to allow the public input, um, allow people to participate, um, but obviously keep, keep the bad actors out of there. Um, I think all along we've, we've been comparing what we do in a, in a, online Zoom public meeting to what happens in real life. And so we've kind of, you know, we've talked about if, you know, if this happened in person at a council meeting or a committee meeting, what would you do if, you know, if somebody got up there and started um, saying something that was out of, out of order, then, you know, depending on what it is, the president or the chair may, may gavel them, get them out of there. Um, and so we've, we've used that, comparison in most cases. The problem with this is that there's there's certainly a barrier to somebody coming and being disruptive at a, at a public meeting because they they have to be there at that time. They have to walk into town hall or, or wherever that meeting's taking place and be disruptive there in person. Um, and with this, with the public meetings, essentially you're 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 expanding that that number of people who can do it to is essentially the whole world and or, or anybody with an internet connection can now come and, and be disruptive. And it's, it's much easier to be quasi anonymous in, in doing it. So, um, so we're still, we have the process down as far as if it's a meeting and we're not bringing people in with video um, and we, we stick to public comment um, or public input with audio only. Um, we have that process down. The, the, the challenge is bringing people in and allowing them to present video or to show their face and or share their screen. So. Ashwin, did you have a comment? Yeah, just to clarify what happened, because I'm, I'm a little confused about just the series of events that transpired. What, what I understand is not just that we had uh, members of the public coming in to make comments as they are allowed to do and encouraged to do in public meetings, or, or welcome to do rather, but that uh, people came into the meeting and then somehow hacked it and seized control of your hosting capabilities so that they could share screens uh, and stop Stephanie from controlling whether or not uh, she can mute them. Because um, normally it's fine to have members of the public in. Uh, the host simply has everyone muted by default and then allows people to speak uh, on a discretionary basis. And if something is said that, uh, if, if, you know, like hate speech starts to mm -hmm. come out, they can just mute them. Um, so am I right? Did they hack the meeting or did they just, or, or yeah, yeah, what happened on um, a you know, kind of technical level? Yeah, can I, I guess I have yeah. to speak to what my experience was, Ashwin. Yeah. Um, so when this happened, and I think I'm pretty sure you were present when it happened before, um, I was able to just remove them from the room immediately. This time, um, I wasn't even getting to muting them. I was just trying to get them out of the room and remove them like I did the last time, which happened pretty easily and quickly. I could not get them out of the room. Every time I tried to get them out of the room and hit remove, their name kept popping up. So I couldn't, I just couldn't remove them. And then I had to just end them. And then when graphics started coming up, I just ended the meeting um, because I was trying to, and there was more than one name. There were several names. Uh, they all came up all at the same time, pretty much. Um, 
as I was letting people into the room. And I think what happened, the reason why they were able to share is because they were let in the room. So panelists, any of you right now have the ability to share um, your screen because you're a panelist. So they were, when they were allowed into, be, into the room, that just gave them the ability to share. What I don't understand is why I couldn't remove them because I didn't have that experience last time. And like I said, the name kept popping up. So to me, that was like, they were able to take over somehow. Hi, I'm just gonna interject. This is Kazi Chaya. Um, I don't have video tonight, um, but I just wanted to mention as we continue to discuss, uh, since this is being recorded, none of the community leaders have given permission for their names to be discussed tonight. So just please refrain from specifying any names. Thanks, Kazi Chaya. Um, Jesse, did you have a, something to add? No. Um, Sean, I don't know if you had any, any answers to Ashram's question about, yeah, so I know you weren't there, but yeah, was there an exploit or hack that they were taking advantage of like a security breach or is it just them playing by the rules and taking advantage of the rules? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm, well, so the meeting wasn't recorded, so we, we don't, um, we can't go back and see that and Zoom gives us pretty limited, um, insight into into the connection um it there's not there's not a lot there there certainly have been security bugs with zoom in the past and i would i would guess that there are some that still exist um so it's certainly positive it sounds likely that they could have um taken advantage of some some security flaw um if stephanie was unable to if she was unable to kick him out of the meeting, um, I would say the most the most likely scenario is they took adv took advantage of some security flaw. Um, Zoom Zoom is not perfect. Um, we're other than things like this, we're a little less concerned with um, the the vulnerabilities of security in, in Zoom just because. For the most part, we use it for public meetings. So most of the meetings that we hold are public by definition. So we're, we're less concerned about people basically gaining access to the meetings. The meetings we hold internally within, within the town, we use Microsoft Teams just because it gives, us, it gives us a lot more control over the security of the meetings. But for our public meetings, we use Zoom because it's, it's more accessible for people Uh, just one follow-up to that um, is, uh, are you getting support from pe from peers at other institutions? Uh, I'm just thinking that, you know, I know the colleges uh, and universities, the higher ed institutions uh, have done a lot of work and are pretty well or extremely well resourced uh, to investigate and prepare for a variety of security scenarios. Um, probably may maybe more well resourced than the town of Amher Amherst is. And I wonder if there might be a way to reach out to them and get support from Amherst College, from UMass, uh, to try to work through this, to try to do a kind of autopsy on what happened and figure out how to make sense of the different options. Yeah, so so we're actually pretty lucky. One of our, um, somebody we hired basically two or three months before the whole um, pandemic started, um, actually comes from Harvard Business School. And one of the th things that he was uh, very involved there was is their implementation of Zoom. Um, so they, he left there before they started having to use it so extensively, but he's, he's been kind of leading the charge within, within the town, within IT. And I know he's been, he's been talking to people um, there to, to get help from them. We, we have reached out to Zoom um, directly for support and their, um, their support is frankly overwhelmed because of the, the, explosion of their growth. Um, so it's been difficult to get support from them, but um, we have, we have been talking to other communities. We haven't talked to Amherst College or, or UMass specifically, but we certainly could see what, uh, see what they're doing. Are we changing how we run meetings going forward then? Will we have, Sean, will you be present 
in meetings to be back up to Stephanie so that we feel a little more like we've got coverage or what is that, has that been a conversation? Uh, we haven't talked about that specifically. I'm here on this meeting and I think IT is gonna be um, helping support some other meetings. We've, we've been supporting the um, council meetings just because of the, the complexity of um, the presentations and everything that go on there. Um, we're, um, we're probably not staffed well enough to be, to be online supporting all the meetings we are. Um, there's always somebody on call and, and I'm available to, to jump in with pretty much any of the meetings to help. Um, but obviously it, things, things change so quickly that, uh, you know, if it takes me five minutes to get connected, it's, you know, probably already missed it, but, um, we are looking at what we can do to, um, to, to maintain order within the meetings without, without requiring somebody, a staff member to be on every, every meeting. Is it possible or would it even be helpful to have someone be an emergency co-host as backup just in case Stephanie's internet is too slow to shut, you know, the meeting down or something. Um, yeah, we can, um, that was, um, we can definitely have someone be a co-host uh, going forward. And I was going to suggest actually to Sean that maybe not so much these meetings, but um, as we move forward with the task group meetings, um, there's three, well, there's three two hour sessions for four different groups, which is like a total of whatever number that is um, meetings that we're going to have moving forward. And it would probably be good to maybe have someone from IT help us with that. And I can reach out to you about that um, after, you know, tomorrow or another day to talk about that and see if that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. So, so IT is always able to jump in. Um, so in a situation, if, if Stephanie were unavailable um, and somebody reached out to us, we certainly could, could get the meeting kicked off. Um, what we've done in, in most cases is um, with other boards and committees is the, the staff liaison kicks off the meeting and is, is co host or co-host. Um, and then oftentimes the staff liaison will, will make the committee chair um, host or co-host. Um, in that case, the committee chair has has the same level of um, technical abilities as as the staff liaison. And we're we're still kind of getting used to it, just within IT, because there are so many different um, boards and committees, and they all they all have their way of operating. That's a, some some much more formal and some much less formal. Um, so I think we're we're still getting the hang of that. Yeah, Ashwin. Thanks for thanks for these responses, Sean. Um, yeah, I, I know you're doing everything you can to address the situation. Um, I'm I'm feeling, and, I, and maybe there's nothing you can do to help me here, uh, but I'm I'm not feeling as reassured as I want to feel right now. Because um, you know, basically, basically what happened the other day was really really bad. You know, it was mm -hmm. a group of. Uh, community leaders, uh, a lot of them black folks, a lot of them Latinx folks uh, who were exposed to just incredibly violent, mm -hmm. uh, hurtful language uh, that just did really tremendous damage to the basic operations of town governance. Um, mm -hmm. And for us, what, I, what, I, what, I'm, what, I was, what I'm hoping to hear is we have thought about this. Uh, we understand the gravity of the situation and here is what we have already done and here's what you can do to ensure uh, pretty much beyond a shadow of a, of a doubt that this won't happen again, because we can't convene this group of people again without certainty that it's safe. We can't proceed with the essential functions of town governance without a really clear and certain answer to this question. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe between the lines of what you just said, answers to my concerns are in there, but I just, I, I don't quite have yeah. a of them as explicitly as I want. So can you help yeah. me? Yeah, so here's, here's what we do know. If we hold these meetings and we um, we limit panelists 
to panelists and attendees to attendees. And we keep the, essentially the, however, however you want to um, vet or, or pre, it becomes a challenge with open meetings, but it, whoever you have, whether it's through a pre-registration process, um, however you control who is in as a panelist. So, uh, uh, let me back up a little bit and explain how, how, how the Zoom webinar part works and then I think I can answer your question is, we're using a Zoom webinar and basically we're, it's Zoom with the webinar add-on and the web, what the webinar add-on means is you can take essentially your normal Zoom meeting and you put all the people in the normal Zoom meeting in to a group and they're the panelists and that that's what your normal zoom meeting where you you know it's just it's people you trust it's it's a i don't want to say it's a free for all but it's it's what we have right now you could share your screen i could share my screen um it's it's pretty open process what the webinar does is it adds on essentially a room for attendees and the attendees by default are um, read only or, or they, can, they can view the meeting, they can listen to the meeting. And then the additional part is they can raise their hand um, when they have a comment or a question. They can type in a question when, we, when the um, Q&A feature is turned on and um, they can, their microphone can be turned on essentially by the host or co-host. So that's with the council meetings, somebody wants to um, make a public comment, they can raise their hand in there. Um, the, the, somebody goes into the attendees, sees that their hands raised, that the president recognizes that person. And there's a, basically the, they're allowed to speak. And then when they're done speaking, the, the microphone's turned back off. So it, that keeps it very orderly. Where we've run into problems um, is the desire to also allow people to participate more than, um, be able to participate more than just being able to speak, more than just audio. So in order to get somebody who's an attendee in so that they can show their video, um, so that they can they can share their screen, so they can show their face, whatever it is, they need to be brought in as a panelist. Once they're in as a panelist, it's much more open as to what they can do. They can share their screen because we have sharing your screen turned on for panelists, so then it's, it's on for all panelists. Um, they can mute they can unmute themselves. Um, they have a lot more control. Um, so the simple answer is people, we want to have meetings where people just participate with uh, audio only. We've got that, we have that nailed down. Um, we have not experienced any problems. Um, we haven't experienced any problems with that, with anybody working around that. Um, the Basically the problems we've had are when it's a meeting, when people are brought in as panelists or early on when we had the chat feature enabled on the first, basically our first Zoom council meeting, we had the chat feature enabled and it allowed, we couldn't lock it down um, well enough that basically anybody could chat to anybody. So we. That's why we shut the chat feature off, just because it was it it was a vulnerability. Um, so I don't know if that it, it's it's a long way winded way of saying that we're we have the audio part down. It's a video part that we're struggling on. We don't know what the solution on that is yet, um, and un unfortunately, we can't. I can't tell you for sure that. Um, if you bring somebody in with video, that it, it won't create problems just because you have 
they're an attendee or they're a panelist. Um, and we, we, there's no in between with zoom right now. Um, and so that's why we're, we're trying to find, we're trying to find something else. And I, I fully realized that we've gone from meetings where somebody wants to come and make a public comment. You're able to see their face You're you know, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more to what they have to say and, and kind of understanding their passion when they're, we're, they're speaking about something than, um, than just hearing their voice. So I, I fully realize that there's, there's a desire and, and that there are also, there are meetings that aren't just committee meetings, board meetings, that there's, that it is more, more of a public dialogue. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a challenge that, um, you know, one of the, one of the answers is some sort of pre-registration process and, and vetting people. The problem is, I think there's a, there's a concern that that could be violating open meeting law because you, when you have a meeting in the town room, you don't require people to register in advance. When you have a meeting in the town room or, or another room, people can just show up. Um, and so if you require people to register in advance, you, you may be, you may be shutting people out. Thanks, Sean. So, yeah. and on that point, I mean, I, I, I agree with Ashwin. I think that we need to maybe take what you just said and think as a committee about how we move forward with our task group meetings and our meetings with our community leaders, because mm -hmm. I also don't feel like we have a solution that will make it safe for us to reconvene those mm -hmm. um, in a way that actually allows us to get our work done. I think we've got know. Yep. competing things, which is getting our work done, doing it safely and doing it within the open meeting law. And right now I don't see a way that those three things actually can work together. Um, and on that point, I've, I have reached out to Mindy and Joe mm -hmm. about my personal concern that open meeting law is, doesn't work mm -hmm. in this current framework. Um, Cause I think to your point, Sean, about, you know, comparing this to what if it happened in an in-person meeting, if what had happened to us on Sunday happened on an in-person meeting, it would be national news. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So like, I think that um, we need to, so like the pre-registration or the, you know, I think there's just a lot that now that we know that we're going to be in this virtual world for at least the next six months, if not longer, I think that Hopefully, and I don't think you as a as as town of or us as town of Amherst can solve this problem. I think it's a statewide uh -huh. challenge. We also don't want to. I think the further lockdown that we do of the meetings further exasperates reduction of participation from uh -huh. people. Um, you know, for 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 us to bring people in who we know, we would have to know them, and we want more people to be joining public meetings. Like so, I think. Um, there's just a lot of things that we'll need to figure out as a, as a committee a, about this. Um, and I think your point is well taken that, and I think we all feel thankful that Amherst has been so proactive in moving forward with virtual meetings, particularly this committee, particularly Stephanie, thank you for pushing to get us started. I know many other town committees haven't even met yet. Um, but I think because of that, we're also sort of have been a bit of a tester on, on sort of how to make this work out. So yeah, Hello. yeah. Hey, this is the Hiya. Oh, thanks, Sarah. I just <laughs> was raising my hand, and I had another question. Um, is there a reason why we have to follow open meeting law right now, and other towns are not? Do they not have open meeting law, or you mentioned that Agawam and a few other towns? <sighs> We're no, not. so my, yeah, so no. My understanding is that they are they are all following open meeting law. Where, what they're not doing is they're not um, allowing live public comment. 
Um, and I don't know, I don't know enough about open meeting law to say whether that's violating it or not. Um, but I know that they are, um, they're not allowing live public comment. So that, that is the difference. One of the differences between what they're doing and what we're doing. Okay. So to me, it sounds like we need to get more information about if their open meeting law is the same as ours. And if it is, how we can also use those options of allowing, you know, just the voice only. And I'm wondering if there's a reason why we need the video. Um, Cause it sounds like you're saying that introduction of video is what makes things uh, more vulnerable. And I'm also wondering if the issue was only that the attendees were made panelists. If they had been kept attendees, would they have been able to speak or screen share? No, so attendees would not be able to. So, so the only, the only times we've experienced this problem is when somebody is a pan is in as a panelist. So if somebody's in as a, an attendee, um, and this is how they they stay when they're at um, town council meetings, the attendees have no um, no ability to speak, share video, share their screen. They can't even see. Um, I don't think they even see the name of the panelists they don't see the names of the other attendees it's pretty well locked down um it's it's not much different than what you would see um when amherst media broadcasts it so they it's it's so view it, only for them it uh, seems like there would be an option then for any chair or host to have a better system in terms of the steps they take prior to making someone a panelist is that correct if they were to, let's say, require that if you wanna to come to a meeting, you have to send an email to the chair in advance and that person makes a phone call to ask you about what your plans are. I mean, I know it's not foolproof because someone might be a good manipulator, but it seems mm -hmm. like that would be a helpful step. Yeah, I think that would, would potentially cut down on on the ability for people to abuse to abuse it, so if they if they remain an attendee, then there's, as far as we know, there's there's essentially nothing they can do um, to be disruptive. Um, I think the the worst they could do as an attendee is be offensive with what they use as a name, because you can put you can put whatever you want for a name in there. Um, but that's um, kind of the Sean. The, I just want okay. you didn't. Um, we lost Stephanie, and she's going to log on, and we're going to need you to let her in, I think. <laughs> okay, yeah, she should be back in um, with her link, but if, if not, I'll, I'll keep an eye. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, so, that, so your idea of only bringing in panelists that you have um, vetted in some way um, works from a technology perspective. Um, I think that that's more of a, a decision for the um, the committee chair um, or or the committee as a whole as to how they want to to deal with that. And I, I know there's a um, a desire to be as as open and, and as inclusive as possible. Um, so I think there's there was some concern about that. Yeah. Um, so I think um, I, I think that. Oh yeah, Steve, go ahead. I, I had a, a, a question on a separate topic, although it was related to the meeting. It seemed that perhaps some of the community members were concerned about being publicly identifiable in the session, and I wasn't. I'm not sure if that's the case, but can we offer? the people that they're participating that yes, they can remain anonymous or no, they can't. It might be useful if we state one or the other so people know that um, they are anonymous or they won't be anonymous if they participate. Yeah, and Stephen, I think that's where sort of we need to put our heads together and, and kind of um, 
figure it out because I think one of the challenges that happened in the meeting, um, so Stephanie just texted, she had a thunderstorm, so she got knocked off. So hopefully she'll be oh. back soon. Um, <laughs> but one of, the, one of the challenges is that people were joining and Stephanie wasn't exactly sure if they were community leaders or not. So I think what we'll need to do, if we're gonna use Zoom in this platform and we're gonna have it be a public meeting, then I think, um, which I think are all questions to be asked, um, then I think we would have to be very sure of, of the panelists' names, of the, of the people that are joining their names. And I think that does create another level of, of challenge because what if you're joining from a partner's phone and they have a different name than you? And I think it's just adding a little bit of an extra layer. I don't think it's insurmountable. Like I think we could figure that out. But I think like Stephanie would have to have a, a list of names and be able to check them off um, and question the people who aren't on that list. Um, so I don't think it's impossible. I just think it's gonna require more, more upfront work. Yeah, Laura, I, I think that that is a, not a difficult task because I have direct connection with individuals and the plan for, that's why I'm asking like, was it because Stephanie made the attendees panelists or was it because back to Ashwin's question, did someone actually hack? Because the plan was for if Stephanie did not recognize a name for her to text me and us to identify the individual. And I'm not sure if just in her um, desire to try and get people in quickly uh, that she let people in that she didn't recognize or what, but that, it, it would what, not be difficult yeah, that, for me to confirm that is what, identities. Because Ikhaya, that is what happened. So if they had been left in attendees. Yeah, Jesse. I, 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 I'm, oh, sorry. I, I'm, I'm, I guess it would be helpful to understand too, and I think this might be part of what Steve was asking is are, are, is this the best medium for what we're trying to do if if we're trying to create a safe space uh, for open dialogue is is the notion that there are invisible people watching um, whether they yell you know whether they bomb or not is that okay and and the second part and I don't know if we need to unpack this right now but I, but I do want to plant the seed of we have many months of of um, what should be more mild weather than the winter. Um, and we have so much open space in this town. I, I, I just want to ask, are there ways that we might think about having some of these task group meetings outside? Is that a... Um, is that a safer space potentially that we could be creating um, to have these meetings? I think yeah, that's, that's a helpful question. idea, Jesse. Um, and we did end up having, Gazekaya, you were there, I know, um, one of the MVP grant meetings outside totally by accident because <laughs> the school was locked. Um, <laughs> and I don't think it was particularly allowable because there wasn't bathroom access or something. But anyway, we did it and it was really nice actually. Um, Jim- yeah, The bathroom was the issue. Yeah, the bathroom was the issue. Uh, Jim, I'm wondering maybe if you or Lauren have experience with people doing MVP grant sector work or work in general that have not done open meetings for those sessions? Um, yeah, the, so three things. One, I love the idea of outside meetings and we've been thinking about how to do this. Uh, um, two, I think there are ways to do this which allow people to participate maybe asynchronously. So in other words, maybe not live. Uh, and that helps, that potentially helps. Uh, uh second and a half thing is we can uh, see people's names in signing up, but, oh, you're back. Uh, 
Sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't think it was your fault. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the third is, that, or second and a half, is that we can see people's names, but it's totally possible to set the the uh, settings so that the names don't show up um, uh, on in panelist mode. Um, and maybe we do that, maybe we don't. Uh, but uh, the th the third thing is, um, it's I, it's I think that the real question about doing sector group meetings, sort of in a more contained structure, in other words, in a, in a more locked down setting, um, is that there, there's a couple of things that, and I'm sure Stephanie's way more on top of this, but if there are people, you know, if a couple of committee members are on the, in the group, then we have to have to follow the laws. However, we can move to something more like in those settings, more like what Agawam is doing, where if somebody wants to participate, they do it ahead of time by email, the rest of the meeting doesn't allow it. Um, and we just say, okay, that's the model we use for those meetings. It's a much more contained thing. Uh, we are in this situation where we, the outreach to bring people in has happened ahead of time. And so it's not so much that those particular meetings need to be uh, for the process purposes, more public. Um, I think that's a totally viable model uh, and one that is much more controllable. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, it does. And I think this sort of leads into our kind of discussion about um, the task groups and um, and how we might might organize those meetings. So that was helpful. Can I jump in? And I'm sorry, I missed all that. Um, we're having a very, very, very intense thunderstorm here right now. And um, I just completely got knocked off my computer and I can't get back on my computer, which is why I'm on my phone. So um, two things. I just want to um, say, Sean, I don't know how to be able to do anything um, with the meeting now that I'm on my phone. So um, I can't ended or stop um, the recording. So I'm kind of looking to you for that. And the second thing is, I want to thank you because um, everyone should know, I kind of, I, and inadvertently, I didn't mean to put Sean on the spot the way he just was. So um, I really want to appreciate um, that you took the time and to answer yeah. everyone's questions, Sean, and thank you. Um, and I hope that was okay. Yeah. Uh, because I think it was important for us to have this conversation with you. So I just want to thank you for that. Yeah, no, I'm happy, happy to be here. It's, you know, I don't want to say this, this part's exciting, but it is, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's what, it's what we're here for. So, so Sean, if, 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 if we're done talking about things that are relevant, but you have to stay on, I, I've been in meetings where, you know, there is a host, but they're just off go off and do something until the end um, yeah yeah, yeah I'll, like actually, you can make one of us a, a, you can make one of us a co-host just in case something i don't know yeah i'm looking at it right now and it looks like when stephanie got kicked off sean did go ahead and make me co-host and so it looks yeah. like stephanie and i are both co-hosts and i can Good. see how to stop the recording and i can see the attendees great so Stephanie, you are still a co-host, so you can probably do it somehow on your phone by swiping, but I'll stop, remind me and I'll stop. <laughs> <working>. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd have to literally like figure out as I go here. So I think the, yeah. there were, weren't many things to share. I did have one thing about the summer um, calendar to share, uh, but that's, it's not, that's minor. I can wait. Okay. Um, are we feeling like we will have time to, I think also debrief a little bit more just on the context of context of the meetings that we had um, in agenda item five. And then I think that will lead into more talks about the task group work, but um, just if there's any ECAC member updates. We good? There. Okay. Um, 
Uh, is the building electrification on the agenda? I'm sorry, I don't have it. it it's me. not. So if you wanted to speak to that, this would be a great time. Um, well, Steve, Stephanie, and I were all on, as well as Felicia Medmont, Nick, and Chris Riddle from Amherst. Um, it probably would be good if we had some other community members um, as a part of the team, because uh, every one of us has questions about how much time we'll be able to put in. You know, I'm not sure I'm going to follow through at all. So um, I know Ruth, Steve had some questions about that. <laughs> uh, so if you know people, um, please mention it to, to them. It does seem like it's going to be very interesting, um, but they are expecting a lot of, you know, conversation outside of the monthly meetings and reading and so it'll be involved. Um, it does seem very relevant to the building task group. Um, so Chris Riddle will be in the building task group. He could be the liaison, but it, it, it would be better if Jesse or Lauren were a part of the team. I, I mean, um, Sarah were part of the team. I, ideally, you know, that, but it doesn't have to be. So, um, do you want to say? I'm still trying to kind of wrap my head around exactly what this um, activity is. Um, it does seem like they, they do ask us very specifically that we're committing to participating in these monthly workshops and at least once monthly coaching meetings with a local expert that they, they connect us with, um, do the work. They're estimating that's about 10 hours a month for each member of, of time to prepare. And they're asking us to commit to launching a program and introducing a building's electrification ordinance or bylaw by 2021. So they're asking up front for a fairly substantial commitment. Now, maybe we can ride along for a while and without fully making that commitment or back out if we decide, decide to. Um, my sense is I think, I think this would be a good thing to try to go for. I think it'll be a pretty big effort. Um, I think if we decide to do it, including a fair number of, of other citizens on taking part, I think it would be good for the ECAC to sort of make a commitment, to make a discuss it and to make a decision as to whether this is something it is gonna support um, and help move through the various levels that it would need to become a proposed uh, building electrification ordinance or bylaw that we, we press. So I think we're going to have to discuss it in some more detail after we learn a little bit more about what's involved. My take too is that, you know, what they're asking is that we make the proposal by 2021. It doesn't specifically say the town would necessarily adopt it. At that time. So I think it does make sense on many levels that something like that would come from this committee, given the charge and the goal of carbon neutrality by 2050, that's very lofty. So on some levels, it, Yeah, it seems to me without doing any kind of an analysis that this would dovetail nicely with the, um, the CCA proposal, move, moving towards renewable energy on the electric grid and requiring buildings to be electrified. Um, so it, conceptually, it seems to be a very good match. I, I don't know the details, I don't have, uh, I haven't yet tried to do any kind of analysis as to how much this would reduce carbon um, emissions. I think some of that information is in the documents that I've just gotten access to that I'll try to take a look at in the next week. So we might have a better sense as to, you know, assuming we can get an ideal electrification ordinance proposed and passed, what would the impact be uh, towards achieving our goals? I think it would be useful to try to get a handle on that. Um, you know, if it's a 20% of getting, getting us 20% of the way to our goal, that would be great. If it's only going to get us 2 or 3%, then maybe it's not something to put so much time and effort into. That's a good question. That's a good point, uh, Steve. Uh, Darcy, yeah. Wait a minute. 
I just was wondering if um, you could share the documents um, with the rest of the committee and um, if there's a model ordinance that you that is already in the materials that would be really interesting to look at um, you know it's it's a lot like you know the the campaign for a, a net zero stretch code basically the same thing I think and but it sounds a little nicer <laughs> it sounds a little bit more like it could be sold to the public um, electrification <laughs> as long as not doesn't get confused with electrocution <laughs> yes there, there are model ordinances brookline and arlington one of those was the first and the other was the second have a template and several of the people that were involved with those campaigns are the coaches for this program so i will grab those they're on a shared document platform somewhere i'll see if i can get those and um share them, I guess, with Stephanie and Laura then to distribute to the rest of the committee. Great, thanks. So it, so it sounds like um, maybe what we could do is put an agenda item about this particular topic on a future meeting um, and Andra, Steve, or Stephanie, or all three could um, present on this so we can kind of decide. I think my, my summary of what was just said is that the 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 moving towards this type of ordinance or this type of thing is probably what we're going to need to do but whether participating in this group and spending the time with this is the best use of of our time uh as a committee or you know do should we be trying to recruit and maybe the first building task group meeting recruit other building sector members to join Sound good. Yeah, yeah, it seems like with Chris Riddle, who's very interested, perhaps he's someone that could take a, a, a larger role in this, where me and um, Andra maybe are, are members, but not taking a leading role. So we can, we can look at those options. And, and Andra, you know the other person, Felicia, I don't know what her interest or background is, whether she might take a leading role as possible. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Felicia. Felicia, she, sorry. Yeah. She doesn't have she doesn't have area uh, knowledge. She doesn't have in, you know knowledge of building the building sector. Okay. Well, I'm I'm interested in I think so far willing to take a leading role on this. Um, I would want to do so with sort of the endorsement and support of the ECAC. So yeah, Laura, I think it's a good idea. Maybe next meeting we can um, talk a little bit more about the goals and the time effort and the, and the Payoff. Okay. I, I, I'll just quickly add from the building group point of view, I, I think a key person to have in this conversation is going to be Rob Mora, um, the, 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 whoever's going to ultimately be administering this and early buy-in from the, from the building commissioner hmm. would be huge on this, in my opinion. I don't know if we've had any luck getting him or Dave Wiskavitz. Hmm onto our group i'm that, i'm doubtful but <laughs> yeah, well that's not really how this is working this is more organizing for the um vote to make it happen it's it's not really it might be better not to try to get too much town buy-in because they you could sh be shut down too early you know let's, let's find out more That's yeah my, I was, sense. my suggestion was going to be to you know get to a point where we have more information and something is more solidified at this point it's just way too kind of vague and um uh dave muscovitz would not be the person specifically we want to reach out to about this and um it's not likely we'll get staff to participate in these task group meetings i think i gave you all an update not sure but um the town manager uh, stated that we can really only invite department heads and it's up to the department heads if they want to allow staff to participate and that has to do with some union issues um, regarding time so you know yes rob is the appropriate person but i would say this is not the time to try to bring him in i i don't recommend it 
Yeah, I think what Andre was saying is this is sort of designed to be a community grassroots initiative. And at some point, I'd imagine the process would be getting feedback from Rob Mora or others in town government, but they are not expected to be sort of helping to develop the plan, is my, my guess is at, at the process. So yeah, we'll come back next week, our next meeting. Uh, I think I can have probably have a better overview after reading the templates from Brookline and Arlington and have a little bit better sense of how what the game plan would be. Great, thanks. Any other ECAC member updates? Okay. Um, so let's move on to, to the next agenda items. And I'd like to um, talk about our meetings in sort of the context of things that we learned, things that we want to bring into the task group meetings. And I, before we start that, maybe turn it over to Jim and Lauren. I don't know if you all have any thing to frame your thinking on that or, or the best way to, to do that. Yeah, um, we put a few slides together just to talk about next steps in the process. Um, we can share those. Is that, is that what you're thinking, Laura? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. By the way, Laura, you can mute people who are making noise. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah, you're good. It's working? Yep. Okay. It's saying sharing is paused, but <laughs> can everyone see the slides okay? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Um, all right. So we are sort of switching gears a bit um, here and, and talking about moving forward. And um, before we do that, I do just want to sort of check in and see how everyone is feeling, if everyone's feeling ready to move on to this part of the conversation. Um, thumbs up. All right, awesome. Well, thank you all for being here. I know it was a, a rough experience this weekend, um, truly just horrifying and saddening in a lot of ways, but we are continuing to move forward and I'm really excited for um, what's to come. So I'm going to pass it over to Jim to just set the stage here. Can we move the slide or is it stuck? So, okay, yeah, it's... Uh, looks like it's stuck. Okay, give me one sec. <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah, that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I, so um, it was, you know, part of what has become clear, ever more clear, uh, as we uh, sort of head into this process. And, you know, the, you, the committee has done a huge amount of work getting to this point. Uh, and, you know, as we know, in the last two weeks, it's like the amount of work has just exploded. Um, and really, uh, it's just, it's awesome that everybody's been in it, been making it happen, uh, and you know, been really checked in. Uh, and I think it's important for us to think about us. Th this, you know, it's like we're a team. We've got stuff to do. Uh, we know we have to make a plan. We've got really specific goals that we got to hit. Uh, we have a fired-up community who wants to help along and make, make those goals a reality. Uh, and, uh, and we've you know, now had a sort of weird shared experience. Um, and I think one of the things that we, uh, we 
you'll see when you when you take a look at the uh, at the briefing that we put together last night um, is that there's this sort of model of uh, what is it that we're actually trying to do? Uh, what we're actually trying to do, right, is we're actually, we've got really important results. This is, we gotta, we gotta make the town stronger. We gotta make the town more resilient. We gotta essentially decarbonize the town. Th those are big results. Those are big actions. This is not child's play. This is serious stuff. Um, we also, uh, we are building a new process and that's why this is so bumpy. Uh, we're building a new way for committees to work. ECAC was already doing that, right? The whole model of ECAC was already building a new model and now we're expanding that new model. Kind of agreed, it's like, okay, here's where we're gonna go. Let's go there. And so that's important. And then we're also building relationships. And that's something that's been very clear in the whole ECAC process. <clears throat> and it has become ever more clear with the work that Kazikaya has set up working with uh, community leaders is that we're really, really working on building relationships. And all three of those are really important. Uh, none of them are not important. Um, so as we sort of look at that as a, as a, okay, we got a lot of stuff to do. How do we do all those things? Uh, then we can look at, all right, how do we do that? What, is it, what does that mean in a meeting? And one of the things we know about the meetings is they're gonna have to be kind of structured. We know they're gonna have to be contained. It's gonna be a lot of people. We're gonna have to figure out how we make sure that everybody participates at a very high level. Uh, it's not going to be able to be that, you know, unfortunately, the ECAC has been able to be relatively conversational uh, in its year long history. I think in these settings, that's it's not going to be able to be quite so conversational, which is too bad. Um, but we have the opportunity to really move uh, the process of getting to those results, uh, move it along pretty intensely. So this is just sort of a description of how we think about how we're thinking about what those meetings look like, uh, that there's some opportunities for us to uh, just do a little things to get us out of our heads and into the topic at hand. Uh, there will be interpretation and translation in a number of the meetings, which means we'll have to be very aware of that. Uh, we're, gonna, we're working on ways to make that a little less intrusive uh, and a little more smooth and in the flow. But uh, the, um, I think, um, but I think that as we get better at it and we sort of professionalize that process, it'll get much better and it'll be fun. It's gonna be a sort of a fun new way of, of engaging with people that is probably a little out of some of what we've been doing. Um, part of what we wanna do is we wanna set context and we call this storytelling. Uh, and that is that there's a ton of context that the committee and that the MVP work uh, and that all of you and like the, the electrification committee, there's a ton of context that's being built that we need to, to convey and engage everybody in and they come, everybody else comes with a ton of context as well. So I think there's an opportunity to set that context in the meetings through kind of in a story more narrative structure that allows uh, that, uh, those ideas, some of the work that's been done already to have a life and to, and to be alive in people's uh, experiences so that they can become real results. Uh, and then we'll, we'll use a draft agenda. We'll, the, the meetings will be pretty structured. All of that material will be ready ahead of time so that it can all get translated so that there's all the, you know, there's, just, there's a lot of layers that go along with that. So we wanna make sure that we make all those layers easy. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit today about the next steps for the facilitation teams. Uh, as we go along. So this is sort of talking about, all right, how do these things go? What is it, what's really gonna happen here? How do we do this? How do we feel that we're gonna be a team? How do we make the whole team part of the team that's making this happen? And then what, what are our steps? Lauren? Awesome, thanks Jim. Um, so the first thing that we wanted to touch on um, was 
this idea of why, why are we taking the time to do icebreakers? Um, I'm sure many of you experienced this weekend um, the, the, the feeling that comes with not knowing everyone in a room and, and trying to achieve a common goal when you don't have that, that baseline built yet. Um, and so part of what we're trying to do here, it's not just doing icebreakers to get to know each other, it's, it's creating the space to make things feel more interpersonal and less virtual and try to you know, work within the medium that we have here um, to, to still give people a sense that we are in a shared space. And that in that shared space, we can get to know each other, we can become more familiar with each other and people can relax and feel comfortable sharing their views. Um, which can then lead to a group culture developing, rapport, hopefully some more conversation within the structure that we're providing, which can then hopefully develop real team relationships and lead to the development of a community of action in Amherst that's gonna carry this plan forward um, as we move forward and even beyond our time. Um, so, it's a bit of shifting gears from the conversation so far, but we thought it might be worth um, doing another icebreaker, all of us together, um, both to practice what it's gonna be like in our sessions to be mindful of um, stating our name and pronouns as we're starting conversations, and then also to get us into the mindset of getting down to climate action work. Um, so just super quickly, I know we, um, I actually don't know how much time we have, but I think we have enough time. To... No, we're not a ton. We'll, we'll take a couple of people's reflections. Yeah, sounds good. Um, so what we'd like you to do first is just, we're, we're gonna take a minute to um, think about the first time you learned about climate change or the first memory you have of learning about climate change um, or something related to that if you don't feel comfortable or don't wanna share that particular prompt, but um, first time you were exposed to the concept of climate change. So let's just take a sec. We'll give it about 30 seconds. Hang for a sec. Think about it. All right, 30 seconds is a long time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, you should have played that uh, Jeopardy. Uh, yeah, it's like do, oh, to myself. Nice. Do, do, do. <laughs> so the reflection in this case is, let's try something a little, we'll do this, we'll take two people, because we want to keep moving. But the reflection is, okay, you just sat down and thought about the first time you thought about climate change. It, has that had an effect on how you're thinking about what the meetings are gonna be going forward. What's that effect look like? Don't tell us about how, what you, your first time thinking about climate change. I had a whole story of myself, but when I think about it, what is, what, how does it change what I'm doing right now? So two people maybe? Some volunteers, start with your name, pronouns, and how it's Steve. affecting this process. Yeah, Steve. Hi, I'm Steve, uh, he, him, pronouns, and what I remember is as a graduate student back in about 1988 or so at Syracuse University in, in geology and having a discussion of a group of people. And you know, to me, I thought climate change was, was real, a big deal. But one of the other professors, one of the older established high status professors was a petroleum geologist. And he just sort of looked and he says, no, no, you know, that, that's just not proven yet. And that same response, however, you know, 30 years later is still, I think, often what we're up against. Um, I think back to that, a little progress we've made in terms of trying to convince at least some minds that it's real and it's significant and it needs action. So I, I think about that kind of resistance when I go into public meetings or other sessions. How do we overcome that? Or how can we overcome that kind of resistance? Nice, great reflection, Steve. Yeah, One more. Uh, sim similarly, a few years later, maybe 93 academic setting, 
geologists. Um, <laughs> but I closed my eyes and I, what I saw was uh, white people and academic language. And I can picture the abstracts. I can picture the reports. I can picture the, the, the science of it all. And it feels, at this point in my life, I f it feels very disconnected from people's daily lives, the sort of room full of white guys talking about science. And I think it's just, that's, because you said relate it to how we go into these meetings, so. Awesome. That's beautiful. I, I, I love it that it's all geology. Um, uh, perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing, thank you for reflecting. Thank you for thinking about the question and reflecting on what it means. Uh, Lauren, why don't you keep rolling? Yeah. So as Jim was saying um, earlier, we wanted to just touch on the issue of interpretation and translation and, and more broadly time within these meetings, because I think as we all experienced this weekend, we're going to be, need to be really intentional about how we allocate time um, especially in groups with individuals who have accessibility needs, but more generally um, to make sure that everyone's having the chance to participate um, and is being accommodated in doing so. So um, we are going to be having interpretation continue um, on a separate audio channel or video screen for ASL. Um, we're working out ways to make that happen now. Um, in a way that will hopefully be smooth and work for the folks who need it. Um, and one of the things that we're just going to need to be keeping in mind as we go into these meetings is that this is going to require participants to be mindful of speaking slowly and pausing at the end of sentences. Um, so I think all it means is that in groups with those needs, um, we will definitely want to do a bit of leave some time for group education and um, just some flexibility within that to make sure that those accommodations are working. Um, and then for translation, we will be also translating written and visual materials um, in advance whenever possible. Um, so that's just a note about all of that. And then I wanted to go more deeply into um, what Jim was talking about around setting the context for these conversations. Um, so we have this approach that we want to try out with um, related to storytelling. We're, we're calling it storytelling. It's really setting the context. Um, so we've done, and the ECAC, as Jim mentioned, and the MVP planning processes gathered all of this great information um, about what's going on in Amherst, how, what people's priorities are, what issues they're interested in seeing further explored. Um, that's what we've heard and then what we know, the, the science, the greenhouse gas emissions um, and other local context. We wanna be able to bring all of that to bear um, in these conversations. And um, one way that we've been thinking about doing this is starting with stories, um, starting with some simple contexts that can um, bring in that background information and frame a conversation around a specific topic area um, and sort of be the catalyst for a conversation that can then go more in depth uh, on that topic. So um, this slide and the next slide have just sort of an example of that. So I'm going to walk you all through. So this is a sample story of waste in Amherst. Um, and I put this together just based on the um, greenhouse gas emissions inventory and the outreach um, results from MVP and um, the ECAC outreach. So waste accounts for 2.5% of greenhouse gas emissions in Amherst and getting to net zero by 2050 means getting to zero waste. However, this number does not consider the emissions associated with the production, transportation and consumption of the goods we consume. And many of those goods come packaged with materials like plastic, which sometimes, while sometimes recyclable, require a lot of energy, water, and fossil fuels to make and should be eliminated. Amherst can do its part by moving toward compostable packaging, creating a municipal composting program, and instituting a local plastic bag ban on its way to zero waste. So this is just one story that came out of what folks were saying um, in the MVP and ECAC outreach that we could use as the basis for a conversation about this issue. And 
one of the things that I wanted to note here, and this is totally just an example that I threw together for this presentation, and it's something that we're going to want to um, work together as facilitation teams to identify and, um, and flesh out further. But it may be that some things like this end up being recorded in advance. Um, just as a, a general um, point of interest that because of the, the interpretation and translation needs, um, we may end up wanting to record some things in advance to help the meetings go more smoothly. Um, so the next slide uh, basically goes through um, what a sample agenda could look like for one of these meetings. And here's where I'm going to go into a little bit more detail about what the, um, how the storytelling component fits in. So um, with every meeting, we probably want to start off with a bit of a Zoom tutorial that we will offer um, before the official meeting starts, just for folks who are less familiar. Um, but then we'll have just a brief welcome and go over the agenda. We'll want to mention interpretation and translation needs at the beginning of the meetings. Um, we'll do introductions in a nice breaker. And then we'll go into those areas of focus. So starting with things like stories, say that the waste story that I just told you all, what's missing from that story in terms of perspectives, relationships, histories, values, um, potential actions. Where does the story go next? What are the objectives, the visions, the direction that we want this particular area to go into? Um, how will we get there? What are the pathways? What are the relationships that we'll need? Um, what are the different actions that we want to take? And what are the co-benefits? What are some of the um, additional positives to the actions that we're taking since co-benefits are something that the committee has expressed interest in highlighting throughout the final plan. So we're really trying to target these sessions in a way that will both build the relationships that will support climate action moving forward, but also um, in a way that drives us toward what we will eventually need to put together a plan. Um, so this is sort of how we've been thinking about how we can structure those meetings to get targeted feedback, make sure that all of the context gets incorporated, but still be efficient with our time. Um, you'll notice that the bulk of time for the agendas is dedicated to the areas of focus. Um, so it's almost an hour and a half and we want to give that conversation as much space as possible and then wrap up and look to the, the following meeting. Um, I think this is my, well, I, I think I'm gonna stop there and just see if anyone has any questions before moving on to um, next steps. Darcy? You're, you're muted, Darcy. Sorry. Um, just wondering when, uh, when we would show the list of all the actions that we, where, where would that come in? Yeah, great question. Um, I think one of the things that we were realizing as we were thinking about how the, um, how the meetings would go and how we could efficiently use that time, we were thinking it might make more sense to use those previous actions as the basis for developing the stories. So we have them um, as the record of what was gathered and we bring them into the process by embedding them within the, the context setting that we do um, so that we're not reinventing the wheel every time we um, host a new meeting. We don't have to cover that context again. We can say, here's what we already know, what do we need now? Where do we go from here? What's missing from this context that we already have? Where do we want to take this next? Um, so I think, Darcy, to answer your question more succinctly, um, those previously developed strategies, actions will be used to craft the context for the conversations to say, this is what has already come up and where do we go from here? Does that make sense? 
it makes it makes sense and i i like the way you're using the storytelling i just am not clear on um you know those we had a fair amount of detail in in those plans or in those actions mm -hmm. organized them into subcategories etc um and looked at the ones from other communities absolutely so i'm i'm assuming that that they will still go into our our analysis of what's going to be in the final plan because yeah. community members and other people won't necessarily you know they will the story won't necessarily trigger the different things that are in those actions i guess i feel like they should be the baseline of what's already been suggested right so i guess i'm just wondering how we're going to factor it in in the end yeah so um the, the that's the whole concept of, of developing the stories and the stories don't have to be simple they can have a lot of things involved in them but part of our concern and i think you probably share this concern is in looking through those lists they're hard to navigate they're hard to navigate for me and i know what they say uh and um and so the we were look, thinking about it and talking to other people and sort of talking about how do you do this and trying to think about ways to take that information and make it more understand, understandable is the wrong word, more relatable. Uh, and so I think that the lists themselves and those activities, um, once there are stories around them, those lists make a lot more sense and that then they're available uh, to participate, to think about them and use. Um, I think it's very tricky to take a list with 75 things on it and hand it to a group of people and say, okay, make your way through this list. Now, which of them do we think are important? Um, we've, we've tried that and it's very tricky. Uh, um, as opposed to trying to set up people with, a, with uh, a sort of narrative that says, well, here are the six things that fit within this topic. Here's how they relate. How do they relate to you? Uh, where you get to essentially to the same point. Yeah, and um, just to just to clarify as well, this is for just for meeting. This is just the agenda for meeting one, yeah. and we have three meetings. And so my my thinking or, or what I'm re what I'm reading into what you presented. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is that this is we we don't want to overwhelm them with the list and. I think this is our opportunity to be a little bit more creative and open about what may be missing. And then I think as we move forward through the process, we're going to be narrowing down a list of, of action items. Definitely, Laura. Um, the second meeting is intended to be more about prioritization and we'll have more targeted um, action items that will be associated with the outcomes of meeting one. Yeah. Jesse? I, just in order to interpret this agenda, do you, does, does anyone have a sense yet of how many people are going to be at these? Is that, is it too early to ask that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the answer is, uh, it'll be at least 12 and potentially 20. Have we got RSVPs from most of the people we invited? We have a bunch of RSVPs, but we, but it's not, um, it's still, it's still a moving target. Are there going to be phone calls, follow ups? Uh, it's probably not for us to answer. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so the, um, there's going to be additional outreach about the first sector group meeting and more targeted active trying to engage and involve people so um there will be uh there'll be emails and there may be phone calls i'm not going to call everybody <laughs> i don't think we're necessarily going to call every person but i think there will be some folks that we will be engaging directly um just from an organizing perspective People may not see their emails, they put it off, they forget about it. Um, the way to get people to a meeting is to call them. 
Yeah. Well, that we can might we be can what we do for our own task groups. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say you could you could do that. I mean, we can we can take the list and um, I don't know that we have everybody's phone number, but um, I find it easy enough to find. Yeah. What we can. Um, yeah, I think that is actually, and that's one of the things, uh, uh, Lauren. Why don't you go to the next uh, well, slide? Well, just I think Ashwin has a has hand oh, raised. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'll, I'll wait. I think it might get answered in a minute. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so this was just to cover our next steps for um, getting into the task group meetings. And the first step we saw was to set meetings between um, basically the facilitation teams. So the task group co-chairs, the sustainability coordinator, and the consultants um, will all probably want to meet in the next week or so and um, talk about what are the areas of focus for your specific task group and how do we want to craft this context um, when we're thinking about storytelling. And um, yeah, and this would be a great time to, uh, to talk about the attendees and, and who's, who's RSVP and who hasn't, and maybe let's go after getting them and, and, uh, and that kind of activity. Um, it's perfect. That's the whole idea is to gather that facilitation team together to really plan for those meetings for the first one, plan for what gets said, give everybody enough time to craft that material uh, and get gather the troops together to participate. Exactly. And then from there, we'll go on to schedule the first task group meeting. Um, I have a note on here that says scheduling survey is linked in the chat, but we don't have a chat. Um, so I'm gonna send um, those to Stephanie to relay to the rest of the committee. Right. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, uh. I totally forgot about that, but um, so we have four separate surveys for one for each of the task groups that we're going to be using to schedule. Um, but first we want to get the co-chairs schedules um, before sending them out to anyone else, just so that we have the, the sort of parameters that we're working with. Um, and then we'll send those surveys out more broadly once we know who's going to be in each specific task group. So Ashwin, did you get your question answered? Yes, I did. I was uh, just wondering how we would figure out how to craft those stories. I was getting scared that I was supposed to already know how to tell the story. <laughs> Not at all. We're here to work with you on that. <laughs> I don't know. I think you need to come up with the first story. <laughs> you know the story, Ashlyn. <laughs> <laughs> cool. No, all good. Thank you. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I see Stephanie has her hand up, yeah. Uh, just really quick, um, in terms of scheduling and availability, I put together um, an Excel, uh, actually it's not an Excel chart, it's actually just a calendar listing, the same format that I used for the committee last year, last summer, um, which has the dates and the names of who is not available during those specific days. Uh, and it goes from, basically it's July and August uh, and a little bit of September, but we could include September as well if people have dates that they know they can um, be available. It's more just about vacations, not specifically other things that might conflict, but um, it's at least a place to start. Yeah, and you'll see um, when you get the surveys that there's also, there's a space for general availabilities and then there's a space to indicate your specific times that you're not available. So if you are going on vacation, you can add that in there. If you already told Stephanie, that's fine. You don't need to repeat it twice, but um, we have that in there in the survey as well, just in case. Um, so that's it from us. Um, any other questions before we move on? Yeah, I do have a question. Um, I, and then I see Andra has a question as well. Um, I liked the way that you framed the icebreaker to like bring it back to the meeting. Um, I still don't think even with 10 people, we will be able to do icebreaker in that way. Um, so I don't know if there's a possibility and this kind of comes and I know we're up against both not wanting to be too tech heavy and the limitations of our system, but I don't know if there's ways to do like polls where people can put in their icebreaker and you call on one or two people kind of like what we did then or you know, other ways that we can get people to type and, and do things as we're going. So we're not relying always on people speaking, 
Um, of course, without a chat, that's hard, but I don't know if there's other means to do that. That works well when I'm on work webinars where people can have the, you know, some kind of way to collect thoughts or comments or do word clouds or, you know, there's links and stuff that people can use. It all gets a little complicated, but um, I guess I'd like to say that I don't think with more than 10 people will be able to do an icebreaker for everybody. So I would love to come up with a more creative solution to that. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Laura, that, uh, that um, we're, we're going to, we want to think very carefully. We want the effect of bringing people in and, and changing the perspective and building relationships, but we also got to be really careful about how, how much time it takes up. I mean, really, we can only take five minutes. Um, yeah, Jim and I were talking about this earlier today, and I love the idea of polling. Um, I think, you know, since there are more things on the IT side of things that we're still figuring out, some of those other suggestions may or may not be possible, but we should just certainly keep them on the table until we know what the okay. final format will be. I bet we can and, do polling. Yeah, um, but even things like, you know, a chat, um, depending on how the, the meetings go, we may or may not have that available. Um, mm -hmm. But, we are we are also talking about sort of um, more succinct icebreakers that can be done, like more you know one or two word things. If um, if we do want opportunities for everyone to participate, so we'll definitely be um, very mindful of that. There may also be an opportunity for people that want to. That it can be self selected in a way to to put their name and something right. about them in a doc that we share so that at least we know people's names um before we start or as we can look and look down and see them yep. um andra did you have a comment question yeah, well along those lines um we can have bios for everybody um that helps people learn who each other are but um really if we're only going to have three meetings we're not going to develop a group culture. <laughs> this group took about six months to develop a group culture, and we we're small and, you know, not so diverse. <laughs> really. Feisty though. Yeah. So um, I think that it's going to be on the task group leaders to reach out to a lot of one-to-one -one, uh, conversations to just know who the people are. Um, that, that's, that's how I can imagine doing it. So at least that the leaders have a sense of um, who's, who's there and, and who might have something to suggest or even plan ahead of time. Um, you know, you have a really great way of putting this. Could you do it? And, you know, if we're really talking about inclusiveness, it's going to take a lot of that kind of work. Um, totally agree just with not that. time in the meetings. Yeah, totally agree with that. One of the things we were thinking about is that, especially as we get to the second and third meeting, that those sort of that storytelling might actually be come from other participants in the in the task groups, and that we set those up ahead of time and, you know, tape them and, you know, do the whole thing so that there's a sort of tight story that somebody tells that informs the next step of the thing so that it becomes much more about sharing perspectives and information. So uh, what I was going to say is the idea of um, preparing things ahead of time, um, videos, presentations, um, you know, the, um, what's it called? flipped classroom you know you get the the dump in you know video before the class and then the class can be more of a workshop and, and interactive i don't know if we could do something along those lines with some of the content but i was thinking in particular with the cca information that would be very appropriate because mm. it's just such a heavy lift because it's so so technical it. and deep yeah yeah Azekaya and then Dwayne thanks I was just gonna say I think that 
Andrew makes a good point that it's really going to be, um, especially now, um, where folks who are, were going to be appropriately guarded before are probably going to be even more so um, in whatever participation they are able to offer. And I think that the, the relationship building piece right now is going to be mostly in terms of how, um, how just communication and interaction goes in the meeting and that actually developing, uh, like you're saying, close relationships of understanding who people are and where they're coming from is much longer work that hopefully will go beyond this committee. Great, good point. Uh, Duane? I just um, <clears throat> wanted to add, um, just as you'll, you'll probably start thinking about the stories to tell. And um, what I found that the one on zero waste was, was well-crafted. Um, I really think it would be, in my, my sense, we also wanna use this sort of as an education um, uh, opportunity and to some extent set the stage for some of the discussions and, and prior, uh, priority setting and challenges and, and conflicts and trade-offs that we're gonna have to discuss in the second and third meeting. Uh, with folks. Um, and so I would try to, my, my recommendation is to make it a bit more of a story about why these things are so hard and what the challenges are and what the uh, trade-offs are uh, so that people can start, I mean, because everybody's going to say, yeah, I want zero waste, obviously. I want all solar, obviously. But why, why is it hard? Uh, why is it hard? What are the challenges? What are the trade-offs? Um, stories about that so that we can lead that into the second and third um, meetings to really talk about not just what people want, but what they're willing to give up to some extent um, to get there. Um, and so I would sort of try to bring that into these stories at the early, at, at the onset, and but take other people's, that's just my thought. I, mean, I think that's a great thought and I'm glad you shared that with the whole group because I think a lot of that will probably be hashed out in the facilitation team meetings, but I think that's a great thing for everyone to hear. So thank you. Yeah, Jesse. I'm also curious about some, if there's a unified way that we are articulating to the groups, what is the end goal of this piece of the process? Like, we are asking for your voice where are we going to where are we going to put your voice kind of thing and if there's a way i don't know if someone can give us some language about you know succinctly so we're all telling these the participants the same thing about where their voice will be held and amplified hopefully yeah um yeah sorry i thought i was muted there <laughs> um i think that's a great point as well and probably something to to discuss as a group I mean I think we know that well, we know that there's a plan to write exactly we know that there's actions that are associated with that plan and uh, we know that uh, the committee the ECAC takes a uh, a lead role in creating that plan. Uh, and we also know that part of the goal of this whole process is to uh, invite others in to shape the plan. Um, and so I think that's, you know, that's where it's not so much people's voices as it is uh, the people's uh, thinking and ideas and experiences that help shape the plan. Um, as opposed to somebody listening to people and then doing something. Um, I think it's a little more direct than that. Um, but that's sort of the idea. And, you know, hey, we've got a ways to go between here and there. So let's see how we do. And that's the part of the, the building. So because you kind of sort of to your perspective, that's part of the building of the culture, right? It doesn't mean building a super tight culture of like, oh, we all do this on Friday nights. It means uh, we can work together. We can generate ideas together. Here's how we do it. We know how we do this because we've built this process to do it. That's what we mean by a shared culture. 
Yeah, Stephanie. I'm just wondering, um, you know, we're bringing in niche engineering and they're going to sort of come in at a specific point. Um, and I'm just wondering how that, it's like bringing new faces in and new energy, new very specific ideas, how you envision incorporating that, their piece into this work. Yeah, that's a great question. We um, so for uh, for everybody on the committee, um, niche engineering uh, is part of our team, uh, specifically around infrastructure uh, um, adaptation and vulnerability and adaptation. Um, uh, um, and I we've thought a lot about this and we had a whole bunch of different plans there's a whole bunch of different things and so I all these different things we're gonna try this and we're gonna do this and I think the uh, the ultimate uh, well th at this point I think that th our vision is that uh, niche engineering uh, checks in with the ECAC uh, and in that conversation we there may be and hopefully the first test group meetings will have happened and that there's uh we kind of task as the as the ecac task niche with figuring out some things that feed the task groups i'm not sure it's going to be appropriate for them to participate in the task groups at this point uh um it's just the task groups have taken on a different life uh and i think we want to respect that life um so that's kind of how I'm imagining that process to work. But again, you know, happy to listen to thoughts and, and you know, I'm, I'm, they're, they're just, they're, they're sort of experts in a particular topic that I think will, that the committee is um, not particularly and, uh, uh, and can provide some of that expertise. And that was the whole idea. Yeah, and just to um, follow up on that a second, um, for the rest of the committee, Stephanie and Jim and Lard and, and team have been offering, or Niche has wanted to meet us basically. And two meetings ago, we were sort of had a really full agenda and I didn't think it was the right time. They were planning to come to this meeting. I, Stephanie and I agreed that based on what happened over the weekend, definitely not a good time to bring them in. So they're gonna be on the next agenda. Um, and they're just an opportunity, they'll come for 10 minutes or something just to introduce themselves. Yeah introduce themselves and to start to talk about where their expertise lies so that we can as, as the committee can charge them to look look at things a classic example of where we might charge them is uh, a lot of towns have developed uh, a forward-looking uh, storm size for sizing infrastructure um, and uh, that's something that they can do, right? They can develop the background, the base information, the scientific studies to develop that, that helps the, the town to have more resilient infrastructure. It's a pretty technical part, but actually it's pretty valuable. There's other things like that that we might charge them with after talking with them. But aren't a lot of those things like pretty obvious, like the staff, started out in the MVP process identifying all the things and and it seems like TPW should be the ones meeting with them and figuring it out, not us. We don't know anything about it. Yes, but remember, Andra, this committee is in charge of this plan. Yeah, but we need the experts in town to weigh in. No, I think that that will totally happen. But I, I, I want to respect the role of, uh, of the committee in being the place where these things start. And don't forget that you may and hopefully will have department heads as part of your sector groups. And so they should be in on that conversation anyway. That's the hope. I mean, it happened during the planning process. I think the thing that complicates this is, you know, that we're in a virtual world now. Um, in some ways, it makes it easier, but also harder. Um, so, 
I know the town manager is doing what he can to sort of encourage their participation. So, um, you know, letting them know that he thinks it's important for them to be involved. Would it be helpful if we reached out to, I, I don't know what town staff would be I, a part of ours. I don't know. I mean, maybe let's more, let's think about that. Um, you know, um, we can always sort of talk offline about that and well, right and also now, in the in the when we start planning for the sector groups to really understand, oh, right. okay, that, you know, this is what we need. I think that's part of those, you know, those separate meetings that we're having as teams for each um, task group. Those are the mm -hmm. times to have that conversation. Okay, so um, I want to be respectful of time. We've got about nine minutes left. Um, So was there anything else, Lauren or Jim? I know Lauren, you said you were gonna send around through Stephanie to sign up for the meetings. So it sounds like the intent over the next two weeks before our next meeting is to have those task group, I forget what you called them, but the meeting of the- Division team meetings, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, definitely to have those and ideally to have the first task group meeting scheduled at least. Um, so I did just send um, Stephanie an email that she can forward to everyone on the committee um, that has four links uh, again. So please only fill out the one that is associated with your task group. Um, and I did put in there uh, to fill it out by the end of the weekend, please. Um, that would be greatly appreciated. And that's it's just been sent. Thanks. So you have. Yep. So in terms of the next agenda, we've got the intro to niche engineering. We've got, let's put the building electrification work on the agenda. And then I think just sort of continuing debrief from our meetings that we're gonna have in the next two weeks. And maybe hopefully if we have task group workshops on the schedule. I think also sort of continuing the conversation about how we host those meetings in a safe way um, and make them as as safe and uh, supportive of our work as as they can be. Yeah, Darcy and then could, Sarah. Could um, somebody remind me of the timeline? When, when are we supposed to have accomplished the first three of the, the three task group meetings? We, we kind of adjusted a little bit. So the engagement meetings that we just had in June have already happened. And that's, that's fulfilled the requirement for the um, portion of the grant that covered FY20. So we're, we've done what we needed to for FY20. So now we're in FY21 and we don't have a timeline to meet. Um, I mean, we certainly have a, I mean, we have a timeline as part of the of the grant. We've kind of identified a timeline, but we're not. Um, it's not as should I say um, necessary to be really strict about it the way we had to be in this last month because we literally had to pull something together over like a month and a half, which Lene and um, so adeptly did. But are we trying to um, have them during July and August or? Yeah, July, yeah. August and September, and maybe even to the beginning of September, early September. Yeah. And we're still, um, I guess my main concern is just the, uh, the desire to make sure that our timeline coincides with the town budget. So that when we, when we end up and the, that original timeline, we had prioritizing items in the fall, late fall or something like that. Um, and uh, that would that would coincide. Yeah, well, and I think- yeah, I think well, we're in good shape. Yeah. yeah. And Darcy, yeah, well, that's a good point. I think we should continuously um, just keep that in mind. Um, so that we know, so we can focus in and make sure that we have something ready for that time frame. Um, so yeah, I think 
keeping kind of that in the back of our minds and if we have to adjust things as we go to make sure we have something to present to contribute to that we we do Sarah Durr, did you have a comment yeah and now <laughs> oh um, back to the beginning uh, topic in the beginning of our meeting is someone or has someone reached out to the community leaders since the events of the weekend and are we I just want them to feel um, like we're we're talking about it we're discussing it and we're not going to just let that happen again and kind of what are keeping them apprised that we're taking it very seriously is that happening I can answer first and then Stephanie can follow up um, this is Gazi Chaya uh, I've been in pretty much round the clock communication with community leaders to be really frank um, it's been very heavy lifting that I'm not necessarily skilled to do. I've shared this with Stephanie and I believe that Stephanie is working on a uh, response from the town to offer um, some sort of uh, offering of uh, more, what would we call, um, trained response. Um, for those individuals, including you all, who have experienced a traumatic event. And um, uh, it is my impression that you all as a committee and town council, um, town councilors and the town are responsible for responding um, to acknowledging that this was not just a difficult situation, but that it was a hate crime. Um, and so that's what I've been doing. Thank you, Gazi Kaya. What is there something specifically that we should be doing as a group beyond that and in support of that? And Gazi Kaya, thank you so much for for taking that that on. I don't know, I don't even know how to what to say um, in as far as gratitude and yeah, I'm at a loss for words. Thanks. Um, yeah, it would, it would be helpful, I think, and Stephanie, maybe you can speak to that. I think that yeah. we're probably all, you know, we got several emails telling us not to do anything, not to talk about it. You know, I think we all would like to be able to understand how we can be supportive. Um, you know, I think we all, we all, guys, as you said, we all experienced it. I've had anxiety joining this call today that I've never had joining any virtual call um, that I couldn't put in place. And then I realized it was because of this experience. Um, so I imagine many of us are feeling that way and not, and I, and that's coming from a, my place of privilege and as a white person. So I know that that's not the experience for others could would must be you know much worse so i just don't want us to to not do anything and i don't want us to do something that's that we're not supposed to do so i guess i would just say we don't have a lot of time today but it'd be helpful maybe to get some guidance on what the committee can and should be doing so um i just wanted to let you all know because i have been in touch with Gazi Kaya, and i've only i mean a few community leaders have reached out to me um that i already previously know so um, I was able to respond as well to them. But um, I've reached out to the town manager and requested that we do some kind of formal acknowledgement um, to everybody, all of you, all of them. I mean, I feel like everyone who was on that call. Uh, I, Sean was on this meeting today. That was my reaction to having to do his own meeting today. I was feeling petrified. <laughs> of being um, Zoom bombed again. Um, so that's why I asked Sean to be here today. And, and also because I, th I think it was good for him to be able to sort of you all to speak to him directly. I thought that would actually in some level help to at least be able to talk that through a little bit with him for the future. Um, and then I don't, you know, as far as the town manager, I really think it would be really great if you all also 
crafted a request and maybe it can go through you, Laura, but just to craft something to reiterate the need for some kind of acknowledgement about what happened. Um, you know, maybe it can even be from something from Paul and Lynn as, you know, council president. It just seems like it needs something at that level. Like people need to know um, that people understand this was really traumatic. And I've, I've expressed how I've used the words violent, um, intense, damaging. I've used all kinds of language when I've spoken to people about it. So um, just anyway. I'm going to jump in and excuse myself. I'm so sorry. I had committed to follow up with one of the community leaders actually at the close of this meeting. So I appreciate you all talking about this subject. I think it's important and I will follow up about what's discussed. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kazi Kaya. Uh, Darcy, did you want to say? I just wanted to mention that the town manager uh, called the two counselors about it, and then he sent an email to the whole town council, just very, you know, generally describing what happened. Just FYI. Okay. So I think that we should all. I don't think we need to necessarily coordinate a response. I think we should all feel empowered to write to Paul and tell in our own words how it infected us and what we think that he should be doing. Um, does that sound good for every, every everyone that wants to and is willing to? I think that they, they should do that. Okay. And we'll follow up next time with more steps because I think we don't want to let this go. Um, I was so excited to see all the community members there and, and the, the nuggets of discussion that we did have as painful as they were after the incident just made me so excited about the opportunity moving forward to work with them and I hope we get that opportunity. Um, okay, friends. It's been a week, so let's uh, <laughs> Call it quits and uh, we will connect soon. Thanks okay. everybody. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye.